Quite a while ago, I ranked all of the games that had released up till Trails into Reverie. But Falcom's other flagship in East also has a massive library to go through, so I thought, why not rank those as well? Just like with Trails, this was very difficult for me since I do like all of these games. It meant I had to nitpick the small problems and then weigh them up against each other. In terms of the games on this list, only the canonical versions will be included, so for example Ophenfell Ganna will be ranked, while Wanderers from East will not. At number 9 we have what is widely regarded as the black sheep of the series in East 5 Kefin, the Lost City of Sand. Now, I'm referring to the original 1995 release on the Super Famicom as this is the one I recently played, more so out of curiosity after I worked with Digital MLS to make a video on it a few months prior. And everything that was said back then, rung true here. East 5 is a good game, it has solid bones, but outside of the name, I don't see any sort of identity to suggest that this is an East title. The music is generic as compared to other contemporaries, the gameplay feels oddly stiff, and the art direction is odd. Not to mention, many of the older East games, at least up to Origin, were quite difficult. This does not apply to East 5, or at least the original version of it. It is very easy, more so than I originally thought, which is surprising considering that some of the mechanics on offer like Magic are just useless. This is certainly a game that deserves a remake, and I'd like to believe that when Falcom have experimented with the new style they're developing for the Room at East 10, they'll come back to East 5 and give it the same treatment as the likes of Wanderers from East and East 4. At number 8 we have the original two games that started a legacy. Now there's no doubt that East 1 and 2 are separate games, but they're normally bundled together nowadays on the likes of Steam and they occur one after the other. It's like playing through two halves of a book. So I'm putting them together here as they're ultimately the same in terms of gameplay. There's no doubt that East 1 and 2 are dated by today's standards. The bump system that persists here has its charm, but it's certainly an acquired taste. Both games are very short, with only the most minimal of direction given to the player, and the story beats are simple in terms of structure, though there are some great moments here. However, despite showing its age, these two games were the first glimpse of the East magic that endures today. A sense of adventure, the silent yet stoic protagonist and adult, and the amazing music are all staples of these two games, and those themes have been mostly consistent as the series has pushed on. They may not be my favourite games in the series, but I certainly have a respect and admiration for them. At number 7, it's the title that revived the series nearly a decade after the release of East 5. There's no doubt that Ark of Nepishtim has a veritable place in East history. It was the first of the Nepishtim engine games, and it had the unenviable task of following up on the failure of Kefin, restoring goodwill with veterans while also acting as an entry point for newer players. Thankfully for us, it did just that. The identity of East returned in East 6 while also modernising the older style. Falcom had an idea as to how they wanted to model the East series from this point onwards, drawing on the influence of the classics in terms of challenge, player freedom and simple yet tight gameplay, while also drawing in more modern design choices like the attack button that was carried over from its previous entry. Now for me personally, E6 is timeless. Its synthesized soundtrack is as stellar as ever and its presentation is charming, but when I looked at it and was trying to separate the other games, there was a certain mechanic that only existed here that pushed it further down the list. And that was the archaic dash jump, a maneuver that is presented to the player but is never taught. The thing is, most of the game is simple and self-explanatory, you don't really need a tutorial for many of the mechanics on offer in E6, but the dash jump 100% did. The input alone to execute it remains one of the most baffling choices I've seen in a Falcom game. Combine that with some ludicrously precise platforming, and you've got a recipe for make it stop, oh please make it stop. That being said though, everything else ranges from decent to wonderful. It's fairly short as many of the earlier Reese games are, but its charm and magic still remain even now. At number 6, it is the canonical remake of East 4. Now, Memories of Cell Seta was the second of the group-based approach that begun in E7, and there were certainly refinements made on the gameplay front. On top of that, the staples of East mostly remain in the game. You've got the excellent music once again, dungeon design is fairly strong, and the region of Cell Seta is intriguing. I also really like that this game is one of the only ones that looks at Adol's history, exploring his motivation to become an adventurer in the first place, which makes sense considering that, canonically, this is one of the earliest games in the timeline. However, for me, Memories of Cell Setter is the weakest of the four group-based games for two main reasons. First of all, the combat is heavily skewed towards ranged characters. There's very little reason to switch up to melee members when the likes of Kana do insane damage at a safe distance. 
The second reason lies with the characters, or should I say the villains. I don't remember any of them in this game, they were completely forgettable. And I think the reason these characters felt like Afterthoughts came down to the story itself and how it was structured. The pacing was a little off at times and the climax felt oddly contrived for games that are normally decent in their narrative. That being said, the gameplay does hold up and it's still an enjoyable experience overall. Breaking into the top 5 is East Origin. Matching up with the name, this was my origin for Falcon Games, the first one I ever played and as such it holds a special place for me personally. It's also notable in that it's the only game that doesn't have Adol as the main protagonist, instead it's split this time around. And in order to get the full story, you effectively have to play through the game more than once. Now that's the main reason why I put East Origin further down the list, because for me, playing through the same game with similar dungeons, bosses and all that jazz just isn't fun, nor is it good design. If there were changes in the dungeon structure or new zones opened up unique to each character, then I would be far more open to this, but it doesn't do that. The only real difference lies in the story that is told. So with that major handicap, it falls to the gameplay and narrative to pick up the slack, providing the incentive to press on. And East Origin certainly excels on both those fronts, along with presenting a decent challenge and a great OST once again. Origin won't captivate everyone, but despite its flaws, I will always respect this game for introducing me to Neon Falcon. At number 4, it's one of the bigger shocks on this list, I would think, in Oath in Falgana. Now while I do agree that Oath is the best of the Napishtim Engine games and one of the better games in the series overall, it didn't grab me as it did many other players. While the gameplay is arguably at its peak in this game, I wasn't too big on the dungeon design and the story was somewhat lacking for my personal tastes. The premise was cool, but I just don't think it delivered on that aspect as well as it could have done. But the biggest reason I place it just outside the top 3 is due to the OST. Even though it has one of my favourite songs ever, as a collection I think it's one of the weaker overall, going for more gritty renditions. The synth rock style is still there, but it's a bit too heavy for me. I'm also not too sold on Felgana as a region, and I do think it has some frustrating platforming here and there. But there's no doubt that the areas Oath does excel in, like gameplay and characters, are some of the best the series has to offer. Breaking into the top 3, it is the most recent release in East 9 Monstrum Nox. Now this game is certainly one that divides the fanbase, as it's more a departure from the standard formula of the East series, that being unbridled adventure. Rather, in this iteration, Ado and Dogi find themselves boxed into the prison city of Balduk, and thus the adventure takes on a completely different tone. Discovery is replaced with mystery as a core theme, but Monstrum Nox takes that unique approach and makes that its own. The city of Balduk becomes a playground for the new Monstrum gifts given to the player, which is the main reason why this gameplay works so well. The action-centric combat is arguably at its best, and the OST is mostly consistent in terms of quality. I'd say the only real stumbling block in Monstrum Nox lies mostly with the dungeons. They're notably limited by the setting of Balduk, and as such their aesthetic design is lacking compared to others. However, what makes East 9 so good for me is that it understands its position in the canon of the series. It's the latest game, so it can draw on past adventures to deliver a narrative that goes beyond just simple references. Veterans of the series will get a kick from the tongue-in-cheek moments peppered throughout, but for me, the narrative in Monstrum Nox is the best that the series has to offer. It's more character-driven, and those individuals as a base build the story into something that hasn't really been seen in an East game until this iteration. Though it was a risk in terms of its approach, I think Monstrum Nox delivers on what it attempted to do, setting it apart from the other titles in the series. At number 2 is East 7. Now if Ophenfelgana's placement was a shock, I dare say this one is even bigger. After playing East 7, I was surprised to see the amount of criticism it gets, because for me, it's almost the perfect representation of what an East game is. You've got the adventure, inspired bosses with multiple phases, decent difficulty, amazing music, and arguably the best dungeon design the series has ever seen. I will admit that the characters who accompany Adol aren't as strong as previous games, but it's made up for with the excellent antagonist, who remains my favourite till this day. I have a feeling that one reason East 7 attracts more ire than others comes down to the fact that it was the first shift away from the previous design, and as such it's a bit rough around the edges. The foundation is solid, but there's no doubt that the gameplay becomes more refined in later entries. That being said, it's still fast and fluid as you would expect. I absolutely love E7, it's got so many elements within it that I value in the E-series, and I'll sing its praises as long as I have this channel. 
And at number one, it is East 8 Lacrimosa of Dana. Any frequent viewer would have guessed this immediately as soon as they saw the thumbnail. I've made no secret on numerous occasions that East 8 is one of my favourite games of all time. There's a partial sense of nostalgia there as it was the final game I played before returning from Japan while also simultaneously reigniting my love for JRPGs that I had since taken a long hiatus from. But to say that my love for East 8 is purely down to sweet memories would be a disservice. For me, Lacrimosa of Dana is a masterpiece, almost flawless. Though I think the game has minor hiccups here and there mostly tied to the raids and dungeon design, it delivers on everything else I would expect from an East game and excels at them. The sense of adventure is there, buoyed by the excellent setting in the Isle of Saren, there's a perpetual path forward spurred by the desire to explore, the characters are some of my favourites within the series, the OST as a whole is the strongest I've seen thus far, and the pacing of its narrative is perfect for my tastes, with some beautifully profound moments sprinkled in between. I can't praise the game enough, and if you've seen my other videos, you'll be well aware of how highly I regard E8, which for me, is the best the series has to offer. And that is it guys, my ranking of the East games as of now, and I hope you enjoyed it. Share your rankings in the comments, give us a like as it really helps the channel out, and I'll see you next week. Peace.